is um, Jo Ezra. So she's a lecturer at the University of Exeter based in the Department of English and Creative Writing and a part of the Institute of Cornish Studies. So her research focuses on people's history, on the lives and experiences of those who have been neglected or overlooked in traditional histories. So along with Dr. Kathy English and Dr. Beth Chapman from Cornwall NHS Foundation um, Trust Mental Health Team, she was part of the Asylum Stories Project. So the project collated written and oral memories from former patients and staff of St. Lawrence's Hospital, Bodmin, as well as objects and photographs. So the project has resulted in an important archive of material housed here at Crescent Kerno. So today, um, Jo will be talking about the history of St. Lawrence's, exploring its origins and demise and the changes which took place in between. So the talk will also look at how these changes can be mapped to reflect shifts in wider cultural attitudes towards mental um, illness over time. So this talk is part of our program of events connected to our current exhibition, She Cares Women and Health in Cornwall. And that is on now for uh, two more weeks. So if you do live nearby and haven't seen it, please do pop in. So I'm now very pleased to pass over to Jo to start the talk. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for that, that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, hello, everyone, and, and kind of welcome. I'll, I'll put my, my first slide slide on. Um, and huge thanks to, to Cress and Kerno for giving me this opportunity. And as Alice has said, it links in with this, this fantastic exhibition, which has, has been running here, um, She Cares Women and Health in Cornwall, um, which Cress and Kerno have been, been hosting, which includes some material from um, Asylum Stories, so from the project that I was part of. So although I'm a lecturer in the English and Creative Writing Department at the University of Exeter, um, my interdisciplinary research is firmly based within the cultural history of Cornwall. Um, and as a former mental health worker, I've always had an interest in the history of, of mental health, mental, mental illness, its management and its treatment. But as a cultural historian, I'm also interested in representation um, and how representation, particularly around mental illness, mental health and its treatment, um, has an impact on lived experience. So I'm going to talk to you today about St Lawrence's Hospital, the former Cornwall County Asylum or Bodmin Asylum, as it's also known, which opened in 1820. It was the seventh to open in Britain following the um, County Asylums Act of 1808 and the first in the West Country. And it finally closed in 2002. At its height during the 20th century, it had well over a thousand patients and was the biggest employer in the Bodmin area. It functioned as a self-contained community, producing its own food via its farms, bakery and abattoir. It had workshops, gardens, a blacksmith's and later a garage for vehicle repairs, a huge laundry which covered other hospitals as well. It had sports teams for both staff and patients, and it hosted bands, balls and dances, as well as theatrical productions and cinema nights. The Christmas celebrations at St Lawrence's were well known, both inside and outside of the institution, involving patients, staff, their families and members of the wider community. So in this talk, I'm going to explore both the broader and more localised context of St Lawrence's, including how people with mental illnesses and disabilities were treated within West Country communities prior to the opening of Cornwall's County Asylum. I will give an overview of the founding and building of the asylum and share some examples of um, patients admitted during the 19th century. As um, Alice already mentioned about the Asylum Stories project, I will also highlight um, some, some aspects of that project that I was involved in, um, along with Dr. Beth Chaff and Dr. Kathy English, who are psychiatrists who work for Cornwall NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and this project explored the more modern history of St. Lawrence's up to its closure with the materials now archived in, in Crescent Kernow. Before I go any further, I do want to highlight a point about language. Um, the link between stigma and mental illness is still embedded 
um, within much of the language used to describe psychiatric conditions or those experiencing them. And this has a historical precedent. To address such stigma, we need to look at its roots. Therefore, it is often necessary to confront such language or terminology which has been used historically. When talking about the history of mental illness and its treatment, it's impossible to avoid this terminology which was commonplace in the past, but it's clearly obsolete today. Language we, which we now would not find acceptable, such as madhouse, um, lunatic, feeble-minded or idiot. Um, and these terms need to be imagined in scare quotes um, and should be firmly located in the past. So people are fascinated by the history of asylums or madhouses. They feature in Gothic narratives from the 18th century through the Victorian period and into the modern day. This long-standing relationship between the Gothic and the asylum can be seen to have implications for people seeking psychiatric or mental health care today. In addition, former asylums and psychiatric hospitals have also become a favourite haunt of modern urban explorers. So urban exploring or um, urban exploration, urbexing, as it's also known, involves exploring and photographing derelict or abandoned buildings or parts of buildings, including areas that are not usually seen by visitors or members of the public. Um, and the images here of St Lawrence's um, are from various urban exploring websites. So whatever's left beyond the boundary and derelict places. And quite often these are um, the most publicly accessible images we have of asylums throughout the world. These vast abandoned decaying institutions, which are often presented and discussed in a way which draws on and perpetuates the idea of the frightening Gothic asylum. The asylum as an institution is a place which has also drawn attention in the last couple of decades due to the increasing popularity and interest in family history and genealogy. This has usually led to more research, both professional and personal, into a people's history of asylums and inpatient psychiatric treatment, which can signify a shift away from these Gothic narratives. So, um, Secrets from the Asylum, this um, it was a, a press release. This is a press release for a two-part series on ITV, which was actually very good. Um, but it, and it draws on this popularity of family history and programmes such as Who Do You Think You Are? But it also clearly identifies the stigma and secrecy surrounding these institutions. So we can see here the Lunatic Asylum was an ins inescapable landmark of Victorian Britain, which inspired fear and shame in equal measures. The Victorians locked away thousands of people classified as lunatic, idiot or imbecile in the hope of treating them humanely and restoring them to the outside world. But by the end of the 19th century, these institutions had become warehouses for the insane. And for many families, the stigma of an association with the asylum created secrets and lies. And certainly, you know, the way that these institutions operate is something that has intrigued people, not only now, and not only to do with family history and kind of TV programmes, um, but actually from their inception um, right to the modern day. And this fascination with the way that these institutions operated was driven through fear as well as fascination. So there's always been this, this element there which taps into this kind of Gothic narrative that we see, still see the remnants of today. So just to clarify, to sort of orientate us with the structure of, of this lecture, um, I'm gonna give a, a background to this research, um, a contextual overview prior to the asylum opening. Um, and I can only really give you a snapshot of the rich history of St. Lawrence's. Um, you know, the, the, it's vast, this is a work in progress, certainly still a work in progress years on, um, and we're uncovering new, new things all the time. So um, I'll give you some background to the, the research, contextual overview of the treatment of those with mental illness in Cornwall prior to the asylum opening. I will then look at the founding and building of the asylum Cornwall's Asylum and give you examples of 19th century admissions. And finally, I shall briefly highlight changes that occurred in the 20th century regarding diagnosis and treatment, 
before looking at the decline of St. Lawrence's to closure and beyond. So just to start then, just to um, give you a quick overview of the, the project that, that this research um, stems from. Um, asylum stories are people's history. This interest emerged from a community-based research project I worked on, as I say, in collaboration with um, two psychiatrists from Cornwall NHS Foundation Trust, alongside mental health nurses and creative practitioners. We collected written memories and oral histories from former patients, family members and staff, the staff who were not psychiatrists, who traditionally have written psychiatric histories. So psychiatrists are traditionally the ones that have, have been in control of um, the history of psychiatry. Um, so we wanted to talk to occupational therapists, to nurses, to laundry workers, carpenters, porters and so on. We ran workshops, events, radio phone-ins and exhibitions based around the history of the hospital. And as I say, much of the material is now um, archived at Cross and Kernow. It was undertaking this project, taking the oral histories and collating photographs, artifacts and written transcripts of people's memories and experiences, which brought to the fore the cultural and social significance of St. Lawrence's Hospital. Significant to Bodmin, significant in Cornwall, and significant in highlighting the lack of coordinated research into its 182 year history. With the project, we wanted to use this asylum of the past to gain insight into and ultimately challenge the stigma associated with mental illness in the present, to gain understanding and raise awareness, highlighting parallels and differences with people's lives today. And again, a quick note on, on language, the use of the asylum um, the use of the term asylum here was deliberate and to provoke thought and dialogue about how a word which was supposed to signify a haven and a place of safety has been transformed into something fearful and stigmatized and we had lots of discussion around that including um, with young people as well which was really really interesting um, to do. So moving on to to context then um, Long, large stay, sorry, large, long stay um, psychiatric hospitals no longer exist. Aside from the three big high security psychiatric hospitals we have, Broadmoor, Rampton and Ashworth, inpatient mental health care is administered through wards and small dedicated units, with most treatment taking place via GP surgeries and community mental health teams. Deinstitutionalization the gradual closure of wards and reduction of the psychiatric hospital population leading to complete closure, saw the final demise of St. Lawrence's Hospital in 2002. However, as already discussed, the 19th century lunatic asylum still looms large in the cultural imagination, an unsettling concept which still contributes to the narratives of stigma attached to mental illness today. And we can see here on the front of this book um, a typical urban explorer photograph showing an imposing derelict 19th century asylum corridor devoid of humanity, a closed and secretive institution reminiscent of a prison. This lingering stigma is perhaps particularly true where the same locations or buildings are used. So the new Bodmin Hospital with its own psychiatric wards are on the same site as St. Lawrence's was. Hence, gone Bodmin, gone up Bodmin, sent Bodmin, still have some cultural currency today. Although hospitals dedicated to the mentally ill in Britain have been around since at least the 15th century, the 19th century was the big age of asylum building. Indeed, it became a legal obligation for the local authorities to provide an asylum. The initial County Asylum Act was passed in 1808, a discretionary act which allowed counties to levy a rate to found and build asylums to house people with mental illness. Despite the 1808 Act, however, only nine public asylums had opened by 1827, leading to compuls compulsory enforcement through the Interdependent Lunacy Act and County Asylum Act of 1845. These laws were designed mainly to address the increasingly problematic issue of the so-called pauper insane, and legally obliged local authorities to provide asylums for their lunatics who were to be treated as patients, not prisoners. So Cornwall County Asylum was founded in 1815 
and opened in 1820. So it was part of this first wave of asylum building before it was compulsory through the 1845 Act. And here's the initial building, the radial building, with its six radiating wings with further buildings around it, which was part of later expansion, which I'll touch, on, uh, touch upon later. And here it is in the 1990s in the bottom picture here, where it was made into housing um, because it had listed status. So why were these laws of 1808 and 1845 passed? Why did this mass construction of asylums take place, which saw over 120 pauper asylums built? And there were several social, cultural, medical and legal factors at play which produced this age of the asylum. And I can't obviously cover them all in this talk, but fundamentally we need to place these institutions within the context of the existing conditions and treatment of the insane in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, particularly the poor, that is the pauper insane. Certainly, although the tendency is to view the asylum system as barbaric, those ushering in the new era of asylum treatment viewed themselves as progressive, moving away from the dreadful conditions prevalent within private madhouses and workhouses. Inevitably, perhaps much like today, many who were mentally ill also joined the prison population. So during the 18th century, for those who could afford it or were financed by their parish, there were private madhouses the proprietors known as mad doctors. Rather than a defect of the soul, madness was increasingly seen as the loss of a person's reason, which could be restored through moral treatment of gentle and well-intentioned discipline within a small, orderly managed private madhouse. However, as profit-making businesses, conditions varied, as seen here, with many using cheaper mechanical restraints rather than strong clothing or alternatives to restraining and administering corporal punishment rather than care. By the end of the 18th century, there were about 45 of these houses which were officially licensed. There were no such institutions in Cornwall. Private patients were sent to mad houses outside of the duchy, including Dorset and London. Some families could afford a private keeper and manage their relatives at home or lodge them in single houses under the care of an attendant. However, many were simply confined within the family home. Concerns regarding treatment and conditions in private madhouses led to inspections and a bill to regulate madhouses was introduced in 1744. These concerns also resulted in the founding of the York Retreat by the Quaker William Tuke in 1792, the model of which was highly influential on the 1808 Asylums Act. On the establishment of the county asylums, this was supposed to be this, this progressive taking um, the retreat as a, as a model. And also on the treatment methods that were used in the retreat as well, initially at least. So the retreat um, was developed after the death of a Quaker in 1790 at a local asylum, and it minimized the use of restraint, instead following an enlightened program of moral management or moral treatment, based on humane methods of reform or cure, using community living alongside rest, work and leisure activities to cult cultivate moral strength and rationality. Treatment depended upon a patient's conduct. Desired behavior was rewarded. However, although it highly influential, later criticism focused upon deeming patients incapable of being involved in their own treatment. The emphasis on moral reform, moral reform and the attempts to control people by placing their behavior within certain social and religious norms. Nevertheless, moral management did humanize conditions for the insane and ensured many were no longer kept in workhouses, poorly run madhouses or confined within family homes and contributed to the founding of such institutions for the poor. Indeed, it's important to emphasize that, that the construction and opening of purpose-built county asylums such as Cornwall's was to address the existing conditions and treatment of the insane, particularly the poor in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. These institutions were intended to remove people who were inappropriately confined in workhouses, prisons, poorhouses, and domestic settings, which often had tragic consequences. 
So I'll just give some examples of these conditions for those who were mentally ill and either kept confined at home or housed in Cornish poor houses and workhouses in the period leading up to the founding of Cornwall County Asylum. So this is what it was like outside of the asylum. So you can see this is, this is 1810. Um, so this is a few months before the intention to build the county asylum was announced. And the West Britain reported that the previous Monday, Thomas Hunkin of Mevagissi, a married man with five children, had hung himself in a small room in which he had been confined for some time in consequence of his evidencing symptoms of derangement. And we have another case here at Hannibal Thomas of Chasewater. Um, on Christmas day in 1812, um, Hannibal Thomas, a poor but once industrious man who was discovered confined to the bed, raving in all the wildness of frenzy. He had been suffering under that most dreadful of maladies, mental derangement for two years. The state of the family was only discovered when one of the children died. And Hannibal and his four starving children were discovered the fifth tragically lying dead next to his ill wife. And these are quite distressing, you know, it's quite distressing cases, but it's important, I think, to put in context where the founding of the asylum was, was coming from. Um, and in 1817, so three years before the Cornwall Asylum opened, the West Britain again reported the death of a 19 year old woman. She'd been subject to fits and occasional derangement but was removed from a private madhouse to a pauper house because of the cost to the parish of two shillings a week, which the overseers thought too much to pay. Being separated from her friends, she had become violent and was subsequently chained. When a fire reduced the St. Burian poorhouses to ruins, 21 of the 27 parish poor managed to escape by jumping from the windows. However, this young woman was amongst those who perished due to her restraints. She was seen struggling in the flames, but could not free herself from the fetters and no assistance could be afforded her. And the conditions in the workhouse for the pauper insane in Cornwall were similarly distressing. On November the 5th, 1803, the reforming philanthropist, James Neild, had his account um, of a recent visit to Bodmin published in the Gentleman's Magazine. Neil described his witnessing the savage and inhuman treatment of a poor lunatic in the workhouse there. He'd been shown to a room downstairs where the man was being confined, lying stretched on a little short and dirty straw, clothed in rags and unkempt, given the appearance of a monster rather than a man, although seemingly reading a book, an interesting juxtaposition of imagery. Neil goes on to describe the room, which had an earthen floor covered in water and human waste more than an inch deep, and also details the violence which had been meted out to the confined man. Neil subsequently contacted the mayor in addition to the parish rector. Along with the magistrates and the physician, they organised that, and I quote, the poor object be taken from his wretched place of confinement, put into a clean room and properly taken care of. The physician involved was Dr. Hall, a humane and charitable man who worked without fee or reward at Bodmin Prison. It was here that the man was apparently taken, placed in an individual cell, and Bodmin um, was the first prison to introduce individual cells. Dr. Hall assured Neil um, that he would take good care of the man. So other cases in Cornwall were observed and commented upon in a, a similar fashion leading up to the founding of the asylum. So um, Henry Alexander, reporting to the House of Commons in 1815, informed the committee that at Lisgard he had discovered two women confined in filthy, damp, dungeon-like conditions, chained to the floor with only a little old dirty straw for bedding, thus sleeping on the stone floor. And here's an extract um, of his reporting to the committee. So Alexander is informing the committee of the unsuitable conditions these women um, were being kept in. Elsewhere, he also gives background to one of these women. She'd been confined for wandering or roving following complaints. Seven years earlier, the man she had been engaged to had left Lisgar for Plymouth and neglected to contact her. She'd traveled to Plymouth and discovered him about to marry another woman. 
It was this which Alexander stated had caused her derangement. Alexander deemed her to be perfectly quiet and harmless. The other woman in the Lisgar poorhouse showed to Alexandra. Um, she had injuries on her arms from the children in the workhouse throwing stones at her. Alexandra also highlighted the, John, uh, the case of John Pauley, who was kept chained on a bed of straw and reeds in Los Withiel poorhouse from 1809 to his death in 1815, and noted similarities in treatment of the pauper insane in workhouse in South Devon and other areas of Cornwall. So in both Falmouth and Tynmouth workhouses, he reported on the terrible conditions he found two idiots in amongst the other inmates. These harrowing conditions could result in further tragedy and suffering. In August 1819, the year before Cornwall County Asylum admitted its first patient, the West Britain reported on a case heard at Cornwall Assizes. Philippa May, a pauper belonging to Padstow, was charged with the murder of another pauper, 73-year-old Mary Jeffrey, in the poorhouse. Philippa had been deemed insane for two years and was confined in the poorhouse chained to a beam in the same room where Mary slept. During the night of the 19th of August, Philippa attempted to escape and strangled Mary, the noise alerting the sleeping keeper of the poorhouse. However, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity at the time of the attack. It seems quite progressive, actually. However, whilst workhouse conditions for those deemed insane were subject to increasing attention, families were exempt from official scrutiny when caring for relatives who were mentally ill or had a learning disability. Particularly prior to the County Asylum Act of 1845, this was understood as wholly appropriate and in some cases a legal obligation. Even after the asylums were built, they proved to be more expensive than the workhouses and families were still reluctant to commit their relatives. So I just want to ha um, highlight uh, one additional case. It's actually a Devon case, um, the case of Edward Lancey in 1855. Um, it's, it's a distressing case, um, as, as often these are. Um, but this case directly prompted legal processes concerning the domestic confinement and inadequate care of those considered lunatics. These legal processes demonstrate the turn towards the belief that in the minds of the authorities, at least, the best place for the pauper insane was the county asylum. And certainly with cases such as Edward Lancey, this would seem to be accurate. It also illustrates the increasing professionalism of psychiatry. So this particular case in 1855 involved Anthony Huxtable being charged with abusing, ill-treating and willfully neglecting Edward Lancey, a lunatic, at Bratton Fleming near Barnstable. Lancey was Huxtable's brother-in-law and he was discovered in a darkened room. The window was boarded up, measuring eight foot by six foot and less than six foot high and the room could not be opened from the inside. Noises had been heard by a local official combined with a great stench. And the official described how he found something like a bundle moving about on a bed. Taking a closer look, he realized it was a human being. Edward was on a bed of straw, wearing only a shirt, talking to himself and with his legs in a bent fixed position. After forcing Huxtable to find some clothes to cover Edward, he was carried out, retaining the same position in which he had been lying. He was taken to the local magistrates and admitted to Devon County Asylum, which had been founded under the 1845 Act. This case and legal proceedings which followed were widely reported in detail. Furthermore, Dr. John Bucknell, the superintendent of the asylum, took the opportunity to use the case to demonstrate and emphasize the benefits of the asylum and cement his professional reputation, reporting on Edward's improving condition under his care. In a judgment, shocking, I mean, I said it was a, a progressive that he was, a, you know, child, but a, a shocking to modern sensibilities, he was actually acquitted of the charge of willful neglect because it was dismissed as ignorance. He was deemed to not have deliberately imprisoned Edward, the lunatic being himself by the very nature is a prisoner. But regardless of the outcome, um, the legal proceedings, the publicity and the subsequent use of this case to mount a campaign for more of the insane to be committed to the county asylums make Edward's story of particular interest. 
And indeed, the asylum population continued to rise, which did lead to more um, abuses towards the end of the century, as patients were not being cured and the asylums became overcrowded crowded and unmanageable. But just to, to have a quick recap, because I've talked about quite a, quite a bit of context there. So purpose-built county lunatic asylums were opened during the 19th century. They were intended to remove people from the inappropriate confinement in workhouses, poor houses, private madhouses and domestic settings, particularly poor lunatics. This was also the period that psychiatry became a professional body. However, as the, as the century went on, there was a huge growth in the, in the asylum population, which was often housing long-term incurable patients. So it's within these contexts that the Coleman County Asylum was established and developed. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about the initial founding, building and development of Cornwall's Asylum. So on the 5th of November 1810, the newspaper, the Cherbourg Mercury, carried an account of King George III's diminishing mental state. His favourite daughter, Princess Amelia, had passed away the Friday before, and this had triggered an episode of derangement which led to, for, to a forcing through, without the king's consent, of the care of the king during his illness act, ratified the following year, and giving George, Prince of Wales, the power to act on the king's behalf. On the same page as this report, there was a piece headed, Notice of Intention to Build Lunatic Asylum, informing the public that following the 1808 Act for the Better Care and Maintenance of Lunatics, the local magistrates in Cornwall were going to consider at the next quarter sessions the following January, the expediency and propriety of providing a lunatic asylum or house for the reception of lunatics and other insane persons. They were therefore requesting the Cornish justices of the peace to procure accurate returns of the number of lunatics being paupers or criminals in their respective hundreds or divisions. The notifying returns had to include the age, duration of the individual's mental illness, and a note of whether they were harmless or dangerous. There was also a separate section of the return for those who was class, were classed as idiots, which, which we understand today as those with varying degrees of intellectual um, disability. This ensured the poor law authorities understood who would be accommodated under the 1808 Act. And it was the poor law authorities, of course, who would be funding those from their parish who would be admitted into the new asylum. However, this appeal would seem to have been unsuccessful, as the following year there was a further request to find full and accurate returns, suggesting cooperation with the clergy and the overseers of the poor who were responsible for the workhouses and outdoor relief, which is food, clothing, money or goods to alleviate poverty and prevent the recipient from having to enter the poorhouse or workhouse. However, any figures were going to be unreliable, as not only were work, workhouse rec, was workhouse record keeping a bit hit or miss, many of those who were mentally ill were still being confined at home. And this could be secretly, particularly in the more severe cases. However, by 1812, the committee had decided on accommodation for 60 pauper patients. It had also been decided that the asylum would not just be for paupers, but for private patients too, so those of a higher class list of subscribers, prominent names within Cornwall at the time, were published in the Royal Cornwall Gazette in 1812. The Prince Regent was patron and he contributed £500. The radial building, um, the original asylum building, was designed by John Fulston. Fulston from, um, from 1810 um, became the leading architect in Plymouth, a status he held for 25 years. The two-ton foundation stone was laid on March the 25th, 1817, overseen by the Right Honourable Reginald Pohl Carey. The foundation stone had a cavity within which different coins of the realms were placed and a piece of vellum bearing the names of those involved in founding the building. Cornwall County Asylum received its first patient into the radial building in October 1820. However, with the rise of the asylum population, it reached its full capacity within a couple of decades. In 1844, additions were made by Fulston's business partner, George Whitewick, who had succeeded his practice after Fulston retired. Whitewick added the superintendent's house or administration block. 
So that's the building to the, the right of this, this picture here, at the front of the building. Um, and I'm going to show you two photos here that I showed you earlier. So we can see um, some of the changes here. So this is obviously a, a, a post-1960s, um, post 1990s photograph um, here. But we can see, if we look at the older photo, we can see the building that was added um, due to this overcrowding. So it's a three-story block at the back um, known as High Building, which was demolished in 1966. Nevertheless, the shortage of space continued with, as already mentioned, the amount of incurable long-term long patients um, being admitted was, was continually increasing. So by the end of the century, the renowned and prolific Cornish architect Sylv Sylvanus Tra Travail, pictured here, was commissioned to design a new separate 250 bed complex with potential for expansion to incorporate 350 patients and including large kitchens, a bakery and workshops, all of which were known as the Foster Buildings, which were the final buildings to close in 2002, as, as shown here. So here's an image of, of workmen in front of the Foster Buildings, not long before completion. The Foster Buildings were named in 1905 after the then chairman of the Asylum Committee, Henry Foster, and they were officially opened in 1906. The reception building um, shown here was in the process of being built. However, tragically, Travail um, did not leave, live to see the completion of his project. He committed suicide in November 1903, boarding a train from Truro in his top hat and frock coat. Near Bodmin, he shot himself in the head with a revolver at the age of 52. And it's not, of course, um, my place to retrospectively diagnose um, Travail with a mental illness. I mean, he was an incredibly prolific um, architect. There is a, a collection, um, the Travail collection, um, an archive, which shows you just how prolific he was. Um, if anybody's interested in looking into the life of this man, it's incredibly, it's fascinating. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to get into, into um, the issues around diagnosing Travail. But I do think it'll be interesting to look at um, what some of those, those pauper patients admitted to Cornwall County Asylum during the 19th century were diagnosed with. Um, and I'll be concentrating on the pauper patients. So for many people, um, this might be their only kind of brief mention or presence in the historical record, which I, I find quite moving sometimes actually, um, along with perhaps the census after 1839, birth and death records. So this is kind of fleeting traces sometimes of, of these individuals. Um, so this is um, held at Crescent Kerno, um, the, the, what used to be the Cornwall Record Office. Um, so we can see that, um, you know, I'll, I'll show you some, some um, images in a minute, but conditions include melancholia, mania, dementia, religious excitement, which I'll, I'll explain in a minute, or what I think it might be, idiocy and constitutional or hereditary insanity. Symptoms could be refusing food, violence, including domestic violence, threats and foul language, antisocial behavior, delusions, and suicidal tendencies or attempts. Causes could be intemperance and drunkenness, religion, bereavement, grief, loss, shame, rejection, marital breakdown, or the softening of the brain through age. Insanity could be caused by birth, so what we, um, or giving birth, so what we'd now perhaps understand as postnatal depression, or even post-traumatic stress disorder, depending on the experience of the woman um, giving birth. Um, it could also be caused, insanity could also be called, caused by occupational accidents, in, unemployment, poverty, or the fear of unemployment and poverty by fright, um, or by fits, fever, and epilepsy. So I'll give you some um, specific examples here. Um, might not be that clear, but just to actually show you the, the archival material itself. Um, so here in March and April of, of 1870, we have the following pauper patients admitted. So in the top column we have, um, I don't know whether it's cut off on the slide, I hope not, but anyway, I'm gonna, gonna kind of read it out anyway. So Anne Martin, aged 43, she's married, she's the wife of a minor, 
um, living in St. Ives. Penzance Union are responsible for paying for her, and she was sent on the authority of William Belitho as Justice of the Peace. Then on the next photograph, so it's, it's kind of the books like that, and it's columns um, across, rows across. Um, we can see the date of her medical certificate and the doctor who signed it, and she is suffering from the mental disorder of melancholia, um, which we might understand now as depression, sadness, um, but it was a, a kind of very common um, thing that comes up in the records during this time. And her insanity was supposedly caused by religious excitement. And this does come up a lot. And I, I haven't compared this across kind of other asylum um, entries in other parts of the country. The suggestion might be here that this is um, individuals that are perhaps engaged in religion that isn't kind of um, Anglican church religion. So they possibly could be Bible Christians. They possibly could be Methodists. Of course, these, these religions are quite specific to Cornwall, not only specific to Cornwall, but quite specific, that actually ways of worshipping um, might not fit in with the authorities' ideas of worship. I don't know, but I think that's a possibility here, but it would be interesting to see if religious excitement comes, comes up in, in other asylum records um, in other parts of the, the country. Her bodily condition is described as weak, and she's neither epileptic or a congenital idiot. So someone born with a learning disability, as I say. She's been suffering from melancholia for about six weeks, and this appears to be her first attack. She did recover and um, was released three years later. And the last com column is where a notice was sent to the commissioners regarding her admittance. So, I don't know any more about Anne Martin um, at this point, but, but certainly we have this snapshot of her life there. So we also have Thomas Grigg, a single man aged 61, who's a seafarer from Saltash, diagnosed with dementia from an unknown cause. He was weak on admittance and had been suffering for some weeks. And sadly, he died in the asylum six months later. The next patient is William Calloway, Age unknown, single and a vagrant with no place of abode. It just says none in that common column. And it says RO, which means reception order, which is a document to certify that the patient is insane. And he's been certified as suffering from mania, the cause of which says cannot say. And often evidence was taken from family members and other witnesses, as well as the patient themselves. So this rather than not known could mean that William was not able to express himself. And of course had no family members to speak out. His bodily health is moderate and it is unclear how long he has been in this condition. He again sadly died in the asylum six years later. We have James Thomas, age 64, a single labourer labor from Tintagel. He was admitted with dementia from an unknown cause in weak bodily health. The duration of this attack was a month and he was 63 when he first experienced dementia. So he had experienced an attack once before. He died in the asylum a few months later. John Hockin, a 56-year-old married butler from Kilio, which uh, I presume is Kilio House. He was experiencing melancholia brought on by simply trouble. In moderate health, he had had melancholia for two years with a history stretching back 20 years. He was discharged and um, recovered. So discharged, recovered two months later. And at the very bottom of the page, we have William Oliver, a 30-year-old married minor from four lanes with dementia of an unknown cause, which he'd had for four weeks. He spent 10 years in the asylum um, when he was finally um, discharged, having to be uh, deemed having recovered. So again, these are some, some other admissions. I'll just run through a couple. Um, so 24-year-old um, Maria Dale, a minor's wife who was admitted from Helston Workhouse, with four-day-old dementia caused by epilepsy. Her first attack was, had been a, a year and a half previously, and she spent 12 years in the asylum before, again, sadly dying there. Um, William Brown, a married, age 21, a quarryman from um, Lantigloss, whose diagnosis was mania, which he had had for six days, caused by drink and religion. It took four months for him to recover and be discharged. Catherine Williams, a 70-year-old labourer's wife and domestic, or former domestic from Probus, she had dementia, spent two years in the asylum before her death. 
um, and John Boddy on the last line. He'd been in the asylum previously, five years earlier, a 38 year old married Red Ruth Minor suffering from mania of an unknown cause. He spent a year in the asylum before again um, passing away. So um, it's interpreting these records is, is as I say, it's quite, quite distressing, quite moving um, quite often. And just to give you um, some more examples here. So um, conditions and causes, you know, melancholia and dementia caused by fright. Dementia caused by epilepsy, where the patient was supposed to have injured his head by a fall when about 15 years of age. A minor's wife with melancholia due to the loss of her husband gone abroad. We have mania caused again by religious excitement and dementia with the cause listed as about her child. A minor's mania was attributed to his having buried his first wife and child in Australia many years ago. And we have mania caused simply by debility and dementia due to an occupational accident at sea. In addition, sunstroke could cause mania, whilst a fear of starvation caused melancholia. And there are also um, records that reveal vagrancy and wandering, often appearing in the cases of pauper patients. So in 1889, Joseph Abrahams was admitted to the asylum under the 1884 Criminal Lunatics Act from Bodmin Prison, where he had been sentenced to two weeks. A fisherman aged 25, he was convicted at Hale of wandering abroad and lodging in the open as having no visible means of subsistence. Edward Drumgold, aged 40, was admitted on the 5th of November, 1855. A single mariner from Portsea described as a person of unsound mind wandering at large, a vagrant displaying extreme violence of manner and incoherency of speech and religious delusions. He had been exhibiting strange and eccentric behaviour for some time prior to his mania. Drumgold's strangeness of con conduct included him stripping and exposing his person. And certainly um, public nudity, drunkenness, incoherent language and antisocial behaviour frequently appears as reason to be um, committed to the asylum. So I'll move quickly on because uh, I am aware of time. Um, but you know, some of the changes that happened um, during the, the 20th century. So whilst treatment before was um, consisted mainly of moral management and restraint, because there were no medications and there was no shock treatment, um, if, if actually, I think if there was recovery with um, people, poor people going into the asylum, it was probably due to improved diet, stability and general health care. Um, I'm sure that contributes enormously to their recovery. But treatments changed and Corn Cornwall County Asylum became St. Lawrence's Mental Hospital, then Psychiatric Hospital, then just St. Lawrence's Hospital. And several factors left to this shift in diagnosis and treatment, including the move towards biological rather than moral treatments, the increasing professionalization of medical practitioners and their medical discoveries, and the crisis regarding numbers of long stay patients and conditions within the asylum. So World War I was particularly significant men returning with symptoms of what would previously have been diagnosed as hysteria, something only women were thought to um, experience, led to the new category of shell shock and brought in debates about treatment and practice. There was thus a move away from moral management to new invasive treatments premised on cure, such as shock treatment, psychosurgery, and by the mid 20th century medication. So shock treatments included um, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, which contrary to what many people believe is still practiced um, today, it triggers fitting and appears to quickly change brain chemistry. There was other treatments um, which we see evidence of um, being used at Bobmin, um, such as deep insulin therapy, um, which is shown here in the picture, or insulin shock therapy, or insulin coma therapy. It was introduced in the late 1920s and used extensively throughout the 40s and 50s. So it would induce, induce um, daily comas for patients um, and they, they might be in a, a coma over a period of weeks. Um, and patients would experience fitting and convulsions which were thought to be therapeutic. It was very labor intensive um, and needed a special unit. So at St. Lawrence's, this was a separate building called um, the, Leninville House, which is about a mile away from the Foster buildings. It's now a nursing home, but it's actually highly dangerous. 
inevitably. <laughs> I think you know it's um, it's clearly dangerous to put people in a coma, and it became um, replaced with drug treatments throughout um, the 1960s, moving moving forwards, which of course brought their own um, issues, including addiction. But what we see in the 1960s is this um, backlash against psychiatry and abuses were identified within the system. So St. Lawrence's was of particular interest, um, although, so there were reports on highly critical of St. Lawrence's. This was actually more to do with the outdated buildings. For example, there were still coal, coal fires on many of the wards. But increasingly the financial and social cost of these huge institutions was becoming a political issue. It was felt that the increased use of medication meant that people could be treated within the community. St. Lawrence's Hospital went through several years of deinstitutionalization, with elderly long-term patients being kept at the hospital. The foster buildings were the last to close. And of course, care in the community and housing long-term psychiatric inpatients outside of the institution, which for many had been their home um, for years, was not always a smooth transition. Former patients may be placed in areas which were or had become unfamiliar to them. Long-standing relationships and friendships were broken. Um, and support networks were severed, and often there was a loss of both work and routine. Expectations for former patients to be able to navigate the world outside of the hospital were often, often unrealistic. Staff members um, recall, you know, because patients were often institutionalised, and staff members often recall patients still arriving at St Lawrence's during the long period of closure to be bathed and fed. Criticism often highlights the increased homelessness of those who have mental health issues, as well as the over-representation in the prison population. So whilst the institutionalization was seen as very progressive and radical, it did bring with it its own issues. So just to kind of, um, uh, towards the end of this talk, I just wanna talk about the, the kind of demolition of, of um, the hospital. So despite the new Bobbin Hospital being built in the grounds of St. Lawrence's, the foster buildings had continued to dominate the site, remaining unused and neglected since closure in 2002. Whilst the 1820 radial building was converted into housing with grade two listed status in 1999, the foster buildings were demolished in early 2014, which is when we, we um, you know, this is around the time we first started the Asylum Stories project. So demolition provoked strong, albeit mixed feelings within the community, as well as increased public interest in the hospital. For some, thoughts of St. Lawrence's produced nostalgic, nostalgic recollections of the community or home. For others, it still signifies stigma, shame, fear, and traumatic memories. And Foster Hall was a particular focus for people. It was an intrinsic part of the Foster buildings and the hospital. But in many ways, the hall was viewed as a separate entity and was a focus for many in the community campaigning for listed status. Throughout the life of these buildings, the hall was used variously for parties, events, dances, gigs, ceremonies, sporting activities, theatrical performances, and a cinema for patients and staff, their families and external groups. However, despite organized protests, attempts to give these buildings, especially Foster Hall, protected status and to reopen at least Foster Hall for community use, Demolition began in February 2014. However, whilst in many ways this felt like the end of St. Lawrence's, um, it highlighted the need to explore these hidden histories of the hospital. Throughout the 182 years from opening to closure, this institution had profoundly impacted and shaped the lived experiences and identities of many thousands of people throughout Cornwall. So, as I say, this is why we started the Asylum Story project and, and I've listed here some of the, the voices that are included in, in the archive that um, is at Crescent Kernow. There was a need to, um, for multiple perspectives, a, a layered history, a new kind of hospital archive moving away from the Gothic narrative to produce a more nuanced understanding of this particular institution. For many people, um, which surprised me actually the amount of people because this was actually a community, a place of safety free from stigma. They felt looked after, formed relationships, they had structure and occupations. Um, so many patients actually have fond memories of their time at St. Lawrence's. As I say, um, it's still a work in progress and there's much more to research and analyze, um, but it's an important chapter in Cornwall's history. 
And I think it does feed into modern um, debates today around sort of social care, bed blocking, um, increasing mental health emergencies and the continued stigma of many aspects of mental illness. And I think it's important to, to kind of um, investigate and get greater depth of understanding of, of the roots of, of some of these issues in, in order to, to kind of engage in more in fame, uh, informed debates in the present and to produce positive change moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Yeah, I've... <laughs> Yeah, as part of the exhibition, I did a bit of research into St. Lawrence's, but it's just so amazing to hear all those stories about like the individual people that went there. And yeah, thank you so much. Um, so Thanks we're now going to move on.